Our state has some incredible problems. My name is Lynn Hinderocker. I'm here to talk about that with you and talk about the trends that have shaped this state and dragged us in one direction or another. We're not really doing what, we're not realizing the dream we had way back in the early 2000s or even around 2008 or nine or 10. My name is Lynn Hinderocker. Welcome to Wild Biz Nebraska. We're gonna get it on right now. If there is ever a time where brand loyalty means a lot. Now we're coming out of the pandemic. Customers are, are looking around for other vendors, other sources of pro products and services. Now is the time brand loyalty matters more than anything else. My name is Lynn Hinderocker. This is Wild Biz Nebraska. I'm here with Bruce Arendt. You're going to see him in a minute. I just want you to know you can hang around if you don't care about brand loyalty. That's a bad idea. But if you want to hang around a little bit longer, we're going to talk about metaphors and symbols and the power uh, uh, in persuading people who are skeptical or cynical or aloof. Let me tell you, metaphors and symbols are the key to persuasion. We're going to talk about urban natural America. We're going to talk about um, affordable housing here in the state of Nebraska. But most importantly, this is a big weekend coming up. Uh, downtown Omaha, the riverfront project that was initiated two and a half, three years ago, is going to finally debut in the whole open area with families, all kinds of activities from from the uh, library in downtown Omaha all the way down to the river. It's going to be very exciting. And so we want you to hang around. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But first of all, we're going to get right back to brand loyalty. The greatest story about brand loyalty I have ever heard in my life comes out of my good friend, commentator, Mr. Bruce Aaron. Thanks for joining me here on the show. <laughs> the great, greatest story ever. <laughs> greatest story in brand, in brand loyalty. Wait till this audience hears what you have to share with us. Now, let me just tell the audience, if you don't know Bruce Aaron, he is the best known, most respected children's book author and uh, illustrator. And uh, he's got two books out that have essentially created a franchise. Bruce, tell us a little bit about these two books and what is happening all around the continent. Well, <laughs> the world, actually. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, I mostly illustrate for other authors. I've done over 20 books, but I've got two, yeah, that I that I wrote that miraculously got picked up. By yeah, a, a not publisher. miraculously. You deserve well, the attention, no, it's to like, be sure. It's like pretty much like hitting the lottery. But um, no, it, uh, Simpsons sheep won't go to sleep, and Simpsons sheep just want to sleep. They're pretty. It's pretty deep stuff. Yes. But um, I had a I had a situation come up last week. I got a, a letter, actually a card, uh, from a woman in Ontario, Canada. Uh, up in Canada. Yeah. Uh, who then? And I saw the name on the on the envelope. It was Joan. I was say her name, Joan Simpson. Yes. And the and the books, books are called Simpson's Sheep. Simpson's well, I, Sheep. I opened it up. Got to put it together. She now. had made this card. We had a cute photograph of a of a sheep, a little lamb on the front. And I opened it up, and there was all these photographs in there. And, stuff. and she wrote the nicest letter, but told me, and <laughs> told me that there are five different. They go back generations, but the Simpsons up there in this part of Ontario, five different families that currently that are farmer farmers that raise sheep. They all raise sheep. And they show They're them. the Simpsons. And they win all these awards. And so she had I had all these photographs of all <laughs> their award-winning sheep. They're award-winning sheep and the, the kids showing them and stuff. It was so, it was so sweet, but. And emotional. She, really. Well, and she said that all of the, she, and she ran across the book in a gift shop or bookstore or something up in Canada, you know. Sure. And so she picked up a copy. Well, then now all of the, all of these relatives have been buying them as <laughs> baby gifts and keepsakes and all of wow. that, which is really, really nice. Of I mean, course. So I actually mean, yesterday, is... I just, she doesn't know it. Um, I mean, she will, but I, I sent her, I thought I'd go ahead and I'll sign two books, send them up to Absolutely. Canada just as a thank you to her, you know, but. You know, anyway, it was it was the a very... Simpsons in Ontario yeah. are reading the, the <laughs> books that have been written and, and published here in Omaha, Nebraska, right. and so, you are the bridge, and you get it, sweet letters. It was just and from I, strangers. I, get, I, get a, I get a lot of, <laughs> I do get you know, I've had a number of over the years. Of letters, course, but this was really special. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. because of the name. It's all almost that. as good as the one where the little boy came up to you after you had read. The book uh, at an elementary school event uh, a while back and said you you taught me how to yeah. draw it was after a, uh, an illustration workshop and, yeah and he was just he was 
I think forever changed. I mean, I don't know. He, <laughs> he just, was he just, prof- you're profoundly but the changing look, the look on his lives. face was I like, love it. you taught me how to draw. And he hated, <laughs> he hated drawing before that. Anyway, Very few so of us can say that we are impacting people's <laughs> lives at that level. All right, let's anyway. move on. Thank you, Bruce Aaron, so much for sharing that personal sure. story. Yeah, we're we're, we're proud of you and uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the story that you've shared and your success. We can all learn a little bit from. So it's a, uh, it means a lot to all of us because we. This is a difficult time. A lot of people are not sure if uh, they're going to stick with their existing vendor or right. source, and they're looking around on the internet trying to find something else and so on. So, so brand loyalty is a challenge. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's flip over to uh, symbols and metaphors, if you don't mind. Okay. I just uh, that was an uneasy transition, <laughs> but what can I say? Um, but uh, I, I, I was listening to NPR actually just the other day, hmm. and they were interviewing an author. Not in your shoes, not as good as you. Not but, as good as me. But he was Probably explaining not. a scientific concept, and uh, he talked about the relationship between bees and flowers, mm-hmm. which was, was fascinating. I didn't really understand that fully. But then it got really interesting when he talked about um, dolphins and uh, um, the incredible... You know, I, I knew that sonar was associated with bats and, and dolphins. I'd heard that before. Right, right. Uh, bats can just uh, kind of detect what's happening two or three feet in front of them, but, but using this uh, sonar radiation, shall we say, or sonic... Echolocation? Echolocation. Yeah. They, they, can, they can see what's happening, or they don't see it at all, but they can hear what's happening mm-hmm. way, way, way out yeah. in front of them. I was reading about them um, recently, and I guess they can, at 600 yards out, or, well... 200 meters, I think that'd be about. Okay. I can't, I, maybe my math. That's off. a distance. But it's out there. Yeah. It's like a couple of driving ranges on the yeah. golf course. They can discern the difference between a ping pong ball and a golf ball oh. because of the, they can sense the density of, you know, the ping pong, pong ball is hollow, golf ball is not. They Extremely can, sensitive. They can, they can actually figure that out yeah, from, yeah, from yeah. like, like, Several hundred yards away. It's a, uh, that's unbelievable. Yeah. They also, he said something very interesting. He said, when if a human being is within around them, you know, mm-hmm. they can hear through the body. They can hear your bones. Wow. They, they know <laughs> the precise location of your bones. He said, even your kidneys. They can see th- right through you or hear right through you. All right. That's crazy. That's 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 crazy. But th- th- the cool thing about it is that these are besides being very provocative and kind of interesting for their own sake, they do give us some interesting symbolic value. And I know that when we're doing these kinds of programs, people say, I already heard that already, I know a little bit about that. But when you get into the, the realm of metaphors, mm-hmm. for instance, the bee and, uh, and the flower. Okay. All right? And I was thinking about this, How you can tell me how you would interpret it, okay. but I'm thinking about municipal planners, civic administrators, you know, people in Nebraska that are responsible for running the community and so on. And they get frustrated over time because a lot of young people, we've talked about this many times, right. a lot of young people leave. So they're sitting around, and I think they're the flower, see? Because these fl- flowers have evolved apparently over tens of thousands of years. Right. But the line of evolution exists so as to attract bees. Right. right. And in our symbol <laughs> dialogue that we're doing right here, um, the, the bees are young professionals typically what I would call urban natural mm-hmm. or cultural creatives, whatever you want to call them. But these are white collar knowledge workers and so on. And a lot of small communities just wish that they would, they would come and work there. They can't get them to come. They can't get the bees to pollinate the, yeah. uh, the flower, you yeah. know? And flowers attract bees either through scent or color. Color. Or shape, even sometimes the shape of the, the stem. stems or the petals or whatever. Exactly, you know? exactly. And it's, and, and there's a symbiotic relationship there. It's a business relationship because the, the bees come, they, they hang out in the flower, but yet that propagates the flower. Yes. You know, or, and it creates maybe a seed or It's fruit, distributing or the that's flower. How we get apples or Absolutely. any kind of fruit, you know. Now think, now extend that then. I mean, you know, if, I'm, if we're talking about Wayne, Nebraska, and we're talking about Broken Bit, Broken Bow or someplace like that, and right. we have a young person that came and did some interesting work there and then went to Broken Bow and formed a partner, you know. Yeah. 
It's an interesting metaphor. It, it works, though. I mean, it it's, does. It's an, uh, applicable. And so if somebody said, well, how come we don't get more of these kinds of young people? We need to have more of them around. The answer, dipping back into the metaphor, is be more colorful. Yeah, change your fragrance. <laughs> yeah, right. Change <laughs> yeah. your fragrance. Yeah. Smell better. Yeah, smell yeah. better, look better. You know? <laughs> yeah. Now, let's, before we back and get into the, into the half hour of break already, uh, what about the dolphins? You know, what, what, what does that mean when we learn about all their incredible ability to, to see into the future, huh? to get ahead? I guess you could, you could look at it from a forecasting or strategy standpoint of a business. I, I bring it, I guess, back to an individual level where, because I was in sales for years, yes. and, and you, you know this, you have to have a sense of audience. You have to know who you're talking to. You have to be able to kind of, with your own intuition, ah. kind of pick up what you, you have to see through their body, like you were saying. You yeah. kind, of, kind of see what they're, where they're at so that you can adjust your message to them. Yes. You can't just sit and you know, fire hose it at them till their eyes glaze over. You right. know? And right. a lot of, lot of times people That's do That's what that happens. That's they're, right. They're, they're trained in a certain way, but they don't, they don't have a sense of, of audience. They they're not a, trained to be perceptive. No. And, and then right. subtly change the right. line of dialogue. Right. I guess that's how I interpret I, I think that's a pretty good shot. I would have gone slightly another direction. I would have said the future, you know, and what's happening in the future, and I would tell a prospect, you don't want the future to pass you up, you know. Right. You've got to, this is the future. You've got to start moving now towards it. My product or service will help you get there. Okay, okay. That's, that's just another you. thought. Yeah. It's wrong, but it's okay. <laughs> right. No. Well, no. <laughs> but I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. No, that's, that is, that's good. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the brain real quick before we go into the halftime. The key, you know, when, when you're talking to someone trying to persuade them to buy your, buy your product, they are analyzing what you're saying and looking for holes or, or falsehoods. Right. They're just kind of analyzing, la, 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 that isn't right, blah, 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 I don't People care People are naturally that. skeptical. Of right, right, right. Yeah. But when you get, but the right half of the brain, when you when you refer to something uh, symbolically rather than literally, mm -hmm. it bypasses all the left brain stuff, and oh. is processed by the right hemisphere of the brain. Okay, okay. Which is completely taken by storytelling, and emotions mm -hmm. and associations. You know, I think I told you the other day I had an event when I was 16 years old. I had a, I blurted out a whole bunch of, I gave a speech that was completely spontaneous. You? Six, yeah, <laughs> 16 years of, of dissent came out of me, and I likened it to, to being in a canoe and going down a, a, a fast river, mm -hmm. and you know, and then there's a slant, and you gotta go down, and you gotta navigate, and you don't hit the, hit the rocks, and so on and right. so forth, you know? Right. And you think you're, you're almost out of control. And that's exactly where I was at that particular moment. The ideas and the, and the things that were coming out of my mouth, it was like... It was like controlled chaos. Controlled chaos. I was yeah. barely able to control myself. Yeah. I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> no, I, I, I did what I did, but I'm just saying that people understand it then when I mention that. They go, wow, that was, you were really moving quickly there. Right, right. Trusting your gut. Well, anyway, Bruce Aaron, thank you so much for chatting with me today here on Wild Biz Nebraska, and thanks for being with us today on Wild Biz, Wild Biz Nebraska. Easy Maybe we can change say. the name right yeah, here. Yeah. You know, we're, I'm going down a river, aren't I? Aren't I? <laughs> anyway, so um, we'll be right back with you in the second half of the show. I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our sponsor for Wild Biz Nebraska. It's called Urban Natural America. You say that word again. Every time I say it, it becomes more powerful, believe it or not. Urban Natural America, because it does apply not just to the state of Nebraska, but really our entire continent, our entire country. Let me share with you what this really means. This is a very interesting word. Uh, I created the word 20 years ago. I remember the moment I wrote it on a, on a whiteboard in 2002. Hmm. That's a fact. And what's interesting about it to people, are all, we're, we're all very interested in what happens when opposites, this is the key idea, opposites come together. What happens? In the past, not good things, but now, at least for a portion of, uh, of our population, of our generation, uh, people are fascinated by, let's get that person and this person, they're very different from us, culturally, race-wise, whatever it is, let's get them at the table. This is the source, by the way, of the diversity uh, movement, which is huge in corporate America today, I'm sure you know that. But anyway, so urban naturalism applies, it describes people, who bring rural and urban influences into their life. Mm -hmm. And it's a fascinating interior design motif. 
It applies to architecture, and this is a big, big, big part of economic development going forward. People are looking for a new style, kind of a something contemporary. Urban natural utilizes wood. And let's talk about the outside of the building now, downtown, wood and metal over here, wood and tin, wood and glass, organic and synthetic. All right? And it's a fascinating style, and people love it, and you're seeing it also in interior design, as I mentioned before. Well, you have industrial floors, very cement and kind of urban, but then you'll have primal raw wood on the walls. People love this. It tends to stimulate, revoke, I'll call them good vibes, positive feelings, and so on. And I've got some evidence or proof about that particular thing. So if you say, you know, we've got a, we've got a great city here. Let's get some people in here. Let's, let's, good vibes. We want to project good vibes. If you feel that way, you have to buy in to the urban natural design format, uh, style, concept, and so on. So look it up, urbannaturalamerica.com, U-R-B-A-N-A-T-U-R-A-L, america.com. And I think you're going to find a very interesting way to redesign, reimagine your city, the kinds of people you want in your city with eclectic design. You know, I'm going to finish up by telling you this. A gentleman named Ebenezer Howard in 1928 now came from Britain all the way to Nebraska in 1928, and he died that particular year, by the way, but he said before uh, he passed away, he said, only when we can combine, um, I want to say this correctly, town and country, town with country, urban and rural, obviously, town with, only when we can combine those will we be capable of reaching our highest collective potential. This is a fascinating comment coming from a municipal planner in 1928 and it's been woven into the fabric of Nebraska. You're gonna see it all over the country. It's gonna be a book, it's gonna be a workbook. Many professions are going, we wanna be more urban natural, and we want some urban natural people right here in this, in this office right now. So there you go, hook onto this word, and I guarantee you, you're gonna feel great about it. It attracts wellness, it attracts health, it attracts sustainability. It's the defining word in our postmodern culture today. That's right, Urban Natural America. Thanks for listening to that. I look forward to chatting with you, your group, service group, business group, a little bit more about urbannatural.com. All right, we're right back here with Bruce Aaron. We've got a lot to talk about before Wild Biz Nebraska is over. Thank you again for being part of the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. We've gotten into some fascinating conversations. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, we've done 72 shows. Have we really? I know. And you're not sick of me yet. Uh, yeah. That's an amazing thing. No, I got thing. sick of you a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, you got to get over that. Yeah. Well, anyway, so let's talk a little bit about affordable housing. Okay. All right. This is a troublesome uh, concept that applies not just in Nebraska, but the entire country. Right. Big story, New York Times, just a few days ago about this problem of affordable housing. Uh, and I went to Schuyler today with my partner, and we talked to uh, some of the civic officials and chamber people and so on in Schuyler, Nebraska, mm -hmm. a town of about 6,000 people. Yep. And uh, it was a very interesting topic. We came to them because we thought, we thought we could find workers, laborers, hourly workers, get them from, to, to, to go from Omaha and possibly Lincoln and convince them that they would live a better life in Schuyler, Nebraska. Okay. And that they would go there and work for a company there. Mm -hmm. Now, as you might know, Cargill Food Systems are in Schuyler. Yeah, they're a little startup, aren't they? Huh? <laughs> yeah, a little startup. <laughs> I think they have 2,000 employees. Do they really? Right there. Right there in, just in Schuyler. Right there in Schuyler. Right? Wow. Many of them people of color. Mm -hmm. And um, they're making about 20 bucks an hour. Okay. They're in Schuyler, Nebraska. Not a bad wage in Schuyler, Nebraska. Not a bad wage for anywhere, by right. the way, if you're an hourly worker. That's, that's right. you know, it's, that's on the upside. Right. Um, but here's what's interesting. They, they, they can't seem to, f to clear up enough lots, enough places. They get the fine and, and the cost of construction yeah. has increased greatly. Especially now. Yeah. yeah. So you're building houses now. They're $300,000, $400,000. See? And these people can't, we're talking about, can't afford that. Well, that's, yeah, that's, right? So they're really yeah. in a tough position because, and I'm going to ask my audience here right now at Wild Business Nebraska, if you had to guess, how much the cost of living has gone up, we'll say in Omaha, this is a, a reasonable number, 
the how much more money people are having to spend each month because of the inflation that we're all familiar with. What, what number, Bruce, would, would, you, would you guess? Just in the last, what, what uh, time frame? We'll say the last six months, you know, something like that. How much more money? You got to dig in your pocket, the gas, the groceries, you know, all that. And uh, how has your, your, your budget, say, so to speak, increased? I would say between 25 and 30 percent, probably. Okay, you got, you get, you're lucky to do the percentage thing, because now I have to ask you based upon what it much. But no, that, that, that's, that's a way to look at it. Actually, the number is 300. Oh, three hundred dollars a month. Three hundred dollars a month. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now you know some people that's a big deal. Some people it's not. But that's three hundred bucks you didn't have to spend before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... and if your budget was already tight. Yeah. If you have a family, maybe. Yep. You know, and maybe you only have one person that's earning a, a living. So anyway, it, it for some people, it could be a crisis situation. Yeah. Right. Now, I happen to know that Skyland, Nebraska, is the most affordable place to live in the state of Nebraska. Really? Yeah. Huh. They are, and that's why I called them and said, let's talk. Right. Because if you, if you can help us get some, somebody there, and, and we'll build a house or an apartment or something, then because they need workers badly in Schuyler. Hmm. They told me they were looking for five people, but when I got there today, they said 200. Wow. They could, they, could, they could hire 200 people right now. But they, they only they have, have, like, have a place to put them. They, right, that's what I'm saying. There's four to five lots. You know, yeah. that's it. That's all they've got. And, two, wow. and, and 200 people, you know, uh, 200 jobs. So anyway, it's a real distorted situation. And, and you multiply that by every, not every small town, but a lot of small towns all across the country. And they have lived a more complex life than we do. 75% of the population, Schuyler, is uh, Hispanic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now you got to think about that. If you're the chamber, right. you know, guy, and you're trying to pull people together and get meetings and have groups and committees, these folks are not, you know, the Hispanics are, are they're very closed. Right. They're sending their money to Mexico, right. to Peru. They, their priority is having a house that they can have three generations, four generations inside of. Mm -hmm. There are people living in garages in Schuyler, yeah. you know, trying to get, achieve what I'm trying to describe to you. So they have a really extreme, yeah. challenging situation. We don't have any real concept. You no, know. Of, of how difficult that yeah. can be. Right. But, but like I said before, I thought that they would have more lots and it would be easier to get financing and so on and so forth. And I could, we could somehow maybe even get a little, rent a little bus or something and take some people out there and say, you know, ha obviously meet with the employer. But they said that's probably not going to work. I was going to say, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Here? Well, here's the only light. Up in Wayne, Nebraska, there's a manufacturing plant that manufactures tiny houses. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. However, there's a lot of laws in, in Schuyler and there are other communities that are very nervous about letting people come in and, and, and buy and live in tiny houses. If they're anywhere near their house, yeah. they don't want that. I see. So it's almost like the old-fashioned trailer home or trailer park okay. Okay. that used to exist. And people get a little nervous about maybe. Huh. Just depends. So I'm just saying. Which I is think unfortunate because these unfor people I, just want somewhere else. I live. think the tiny houses, if they would rezone the area, and make sure that it's a very kind of quality and there's standards there and so on and there's cement and you yeah. don't let your stuff go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think tiny houses are a tremendous solution. Yeah. John Mellencamp even wrote a song about it. Did he really? Little pink houses, remember that, <laughs> whatever. I'm sorry, that was bad. I would have never thought that. <laughs> All right, Bruce Aaron. Hey, listen, are seminars, live seminars still viable? We're, we've given some thought recently to doing some workshops and seminars and so on. Some people think it's a great idea. Some people don't. Just real quick, we got one minute to go. They here. haven't been for a little while. Yeah. But I think that's coming back on where people actually want, they're craving um, interaction. Social, with social yeah. interaction. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I think you're right. And <clears throat> there's been a lot of things that have happened with technology, marketing, management. There's new leadership styles. I mean, you could have seminars about uh, how to make workers happy so they don't get up and leave you, you know. Right on the fly because right. it's, that also is happening. The dynamics have changed between worker and employer. And as much as Zoom has been a successful thing for people, I think a lot of people are really sick of it, you know, just having to do the teleconferencing kind of thing. I think that's just It's hard, hard. to be yourself well, in yeah. a Zoom situation, yeah. you know. Especially when you were in, you know, bottom half of you's in pajamas. That's just, that's just hard. And, and I was going <laughs> to just say, I hope you don't mind. No, listen, one thing I want to ask you this, if, if I had three different things that 
employees, if you're an employee, what do you want, what do you really want out of life and work and so on, what do you think the number one thing is? You hit on it briefly, but I just, this is really interesting. Um, the number one thing that a worker wants from an environment, the employee culture and so on, what they really want. I would think they would want respect. Yeah, you're very, very close. Am I close? I say. Okay. Very close. Fulfillment or whatever. They want to be uh, appreciated for their authentic self. Oh, okay. Who they really are. Right. Now, I don't know how you get somebody to say, this is how I really am as opposed to this. You know, we all try to dive into our job description mm -hmm. and say, well, uh, I, I can do all that. Yeah, you I know? can check these boxes. Right, 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 right. Check these boxes. But when it's, when it's all said and done and the boss is gone and so on, you know, you do things your way. Right. And that may or may not be the way uh, the person next to you does and that's them. That's the hard part about hiring people because you don't know really. You don't really know what you're getting. Until they're on the job, you don't necessarily no. know. No, yeah. exactly right. But I, I thought that was that's, so interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it could be a consulting you know, product or service where you help people reveal their, their authentic self and, and help them, uh, I'll, I'll just say it this way, and I want you to um, debate me on this briefly, which is I think that the friction, the natural friction that comes from employment, mm -hmm. you know, you're around people, right. some people you go with, some people you don't, some people I don't like his attitude. Yeah. <clears throat> that's the wonderful, that's a cauldron for knowing yourself. Yeah. I'm the kind of, I see now, I'm the kind of person, I get offended by stuff, you know, and I, 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 I got to get over you that. see what you like and don't like. You yes. Know, so it helps you self-define. Define, define maybe, yourself. Maybe the things you hadn't really given much thought to. Yes. You know. And you thought everybody should accept me that way, and all of a sudden you realize, that's counterproductive. Yeah. I have a bad temper. I thought I was here to, to uh, you know, tell everybody what to do. Right. Now I realize that it's my reaction to their behavior that really amounts. Yeah. That's really emotional intelligence. Yeah. Do you think that's interesting? I, I think it's very. I, I think, think it's, it's and it's it's revealing. But people have to be honest enough with themselves. Yes. To come come around to themselves and say, you know, there's things I like about myself, but there's things that need work. Yeah. And a work culture can give you that kind of yeah. insight if you're open to that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. We're here on with uh, Bruce Arendt on Wild Biz Nebraska. We've had another fascinating. Uh, uh, show here and I appreciate you being with me and contributing and good luck and thank you again so much for uh, sharing that story about <laughs> those the Simpsons that love the book about the Simpsons. You're right. It's That's awesome. It's, it's Brand loyalty is the key. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time on Wild Biz Nebraska. I'm Lynn Hinderocker. Thanks. <laughs>